Greetings and salutations, world. My name is Rob Candell. It is 10 a.m. PST live here from Woodland, California, Woodland Hills, California, here with a very special good friend, client, an all around amazing person, Kasha, who will be uh, joining us on the show talking about, well, many things. Talking about, really, uh, in my opinion, one of the best, strongest cures, procedures, methods to equate situations where there's an imbalance of power between men and women. And I've had the absolute honor to be witness to the last part of this last couple of months of her journey and just recently uh, some significant attention from the media in places like the New York Times, the New York Magazine, and Psychology Today. And I'm here to welcome Kasha to the show. Hi. Hi. How so are happy you? to be here. Really good. It's awesome. All right. <laughs> so first off, congratulations on what's happening. How does it feel to be thrust into the limelight in terms of this conversation about the unbalance of power between men and women? Uh, I feel two ways about it. So it depends on when you catch me. Um, there How about right, How about right now? Oh, um, I feel unaffected by it. Mm. There's a lot of work to do. Mm -hmm. um, the other times I get very, very, very excited that there are women whose faces I'll never see, mm. uh, who will be able to read something, get something, try something, practice something, see things slightly differently. And uh, that really, 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 really excites me. So the, the, unknown, the unknown woman, the woman who you've never touched personally, you know, reading, getting inspired by what you do, and that's that's what turns you on. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. There was yeah. there was a lot of mention in both articles about this concept of you being a secret underground school. This concept that you were below the radar, and then all of a sudden you're rising up and like you're been thrust into the limelight. I thought that was interesting in both articles. Was that your intention to have an underground school? So the um, the way that we teach in the school. It has everything to do with embodied truth and embodied communication. So working with students, it's really, really important when working on that level to work in small groups, to have a safe container, to have women be able to reveal everything and feel safe to play way beyond where they would play if they didn't have such safety and such privacy. Hmm. And over the life of the school, uh, in working with them, there are more and more exercises and tools developed that could be used outside of those really intense, private, embodied group scenarios. And the world started to change. I mean, the first, the first thing that happened was when Trump got elected, our student body freaked out. Mm -hmm. They watched the debates and they watched... Hillary do some of the things that we were talking about in class. They were like, they were basically telling us that we need to reach more people. Mm. So that was the first moment where we decided to take the password protection off the website mm. and start doing bigger events and using some of the tools that could apply outside of a small group intensive format to as many people as we could. And then, then, the, then the Me Too thing, even the police brutality, Black Lives Matter became a thing. Mm -hmm. Race comes up as an issue in our classes, even though it's classes for women, because it deals with power dynamics. And power dynamics, we may be teaching women, but they're essentially genderless. Power is power. How people abuse power, how people get stuck uh, at the effect of power uh, applies to everybody, regardless of their sexual orientation, their gender, their their race, what color hat they wear. Mm -hmm. Pink. You know, <laughs> I, I've, I've been reading your articles and working with you, obviously, and something, I got a subtle thing that you believe in that I didn't quite get. Actually, it was a post you just did recently where you said the end of the patriarchy, the, the party at the end of the patriarchy. And so what I, my impression, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is you don't want to fight the patriarchy per se. You want to just end the patriarchy? What is the difference between the two? Oh, fighting and ending, the difference is huge. So um, this is a perfect, perfect metaphor. 
Mm. on the level of two human beings, right? The dyad, in which it's really easy to see a power dynamic at play. If one person is asking for something that they want of the other, but all of the world of their communication, their bodily feeling, their focus, their attention is on what they don't want. The other person gets blasted with information about what's not wanted, not mm -hmm. what's wanted. Mm -hmm. So like a really simple thing, like uh, if I asked you to change the angle of the camera mm -hmm. and I asked you with, at, with all of the complaint in my body, what happens to you? Rob, will you change? Will you please change the angle of your camera? Then I feel like I'm doing something wrong immediately. And that's all I'm thinking yeah. about. Yeah, yeah. And you can't win. If you agree, you're a fucking loser. Mm -hmm. If you disagree, you're a loser. You're a loser. There's a no-win situation for you at the at the other at the other side of that communication. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of macro forces, in terms of big political struggles, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. When we're fighting against something, there's a passion in us for something we want. But if we get focused on the obstacle to such a degree that we forget what we're fighting for, mm -hmm. the passion, the love, and the commitment has nowhere to go except into destruction. Mm -hmm. So the difference between ending the patriarchy and fighting the patriarchy is huge. Because mm -hmm. if you're celebrating the party at the end of the patriarchy, you're looking at what kind of world you want. You're already in the space of coming up with solutions with your imagination expanded based on what your heart truly wants. And it's so much easier for two parties to find a common ground and generate solutions that would have been beyond the scope of what would have been possible if they were just talking about what we're fighting against. Mm -hmm. We're making the wrong enemies. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had a lot of debates with people around these women marches and a lot of, I personally celebrate them. I think they're a powerful thing because you know women and men are getting together to celebrate. And, and this is an important and, I also feel the, the negativity, like the, the fight, the push against it. The, so it's a complicated thing for me to feel into my thoughts around women marches that have happened last year. And of course, they happened last weekend. Do you have any thoughts about the vibe or the feeling of the women's march and in terms of this conversation? Yeah, I think um, one of the things that we as a human civilization lack is an understanding of emotional alchemy. We okay. really don't like negative emotions. We really do not like negative emotions. They're very socially unacceptable mm -hmm. unless they are in an action movie against a villain, right? Okay. So anger and rage. Or sports. Sports are very popular for the emotions. Right. There's yeah. certain containers where there's certain parameters where certain people get to express certain things, certain mm -hmm. kinds of... So um, negativity, uh, to, to be... Uh, where I would love for human civilization to go is to understand emotions better and know how to use them better. Mm -hmm. So uh, the rage is important. The negativity, the fury, the hurt, the sadness, because it's energy, it's fuel. But if you don't remember what you're using it for, it doesn't have a chance to alchemize into something greater. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we march and are angry, there's a lot of different things about marches themselves that are great, that have different elements. Uh, but just in terms of the negativity, uh, if we, again, remember what we're fighting for while mm -hmm. we're fighting against, then the, 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 the beautiful treasure hidden inside anger and rage is passion. Mm -hmm. You don't get angry when you're not passionate. You don't even get defensive in places where there isn't something to protect. Mm -hmm. So there's love inside defensiveness and there's passion inside anger. And what I care about is that human beings begin learning how to embrace anger or defensiveness or sadness and find the treasure inside it, which is the thing they truly want. Nobody wants to march forever and be angry forever. And it's so easy in that, that uh, volatility and in that explosive quality to obscure that the reason it's coming up is because we have love inside us. We have something we want inside us. We have passion inside us. So if what we're fighting against is a wall, 
what we're fighting for is the reason to get through the wall. Mm-hmm. And, and the, the, even the post about the party at the end of the patriarchy is just a small suggestion to have people start imagining the world they want to create, that this anger, that this fury, that this uh, uh, disappointment can turn into energy towards building. I think that's everything. I mean, I think that's the key to everything. Hmm. Uh, one of the, the, the mottos of our school, which we tell our students, is use everything. Mm-hmm. Use everything. Uh, 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 a vice in its proper place becomes a virtue. Mm-hmm. There's a place where laziness becomes efficiency. There's a, a place where greed becomes um, uh, self-protection, saving for the winter. There are all these things that, that are not so black and white um, that are so, so much more elegantly addressed when they're seen in their totality. That, I mean, that, yeah, I mean, that really fits in with my practice, my lineage, my concepts. It's like you have these human emotions that we deny or not confront and guess where they go? They go into your shadow and they're actually running the show that laziness is running for the show. I don't want to look at my laziness at the same time so, so confront that so it can alchemize, as you say, into empowerment. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so there's, Me Too is such a huge thing and um, I've been doing a lot of research and reading and thinking about it. <clears throat> and um, I actually got invited to a men's only Facebook group recently and I was uh, post. I posted about this interview. I'm not sure if anyone came from it, but the response that I'm seeing inside men's response to me too is very negative, scared, defensive, um, passive aggressive. There's been a very strong I'm noticing response of men to me too. And so, just a little snippet from this group was um, men's anger about not having the relationship they want. Uh, men saying the fact that they're abused as much as women, that the media think that women own victimhood, um, a post about uh, the, a video about the war on men. So my point is, is Me Too is arising for men and they're feeling a lot of feelings. Um, and I know you work also with women and men. What's your response to men who are having a fear-based response to Me Too? That one of the beauties of this time is that all of these things in their actual form are pretty complex and rich and nuanced and that to have a real conversation like mm-hmm. we're having to have mm-hmm. a real conversation about any of these issues actually requires becoming much more uh, aware and nuanced than most people are used to mm-hmm. um one of the questions I get really often is about a potential backlash, a backlash against me too. Mm. One of the things I keep saying is we need to make allies out of men fast. Mm. We need to make allies out of the men. Grab all the men you can, give them something to do, give mm-hmm. them a way to participate. They don't have to leave the show, but they cannot be excluded because if they're excluded, they're sitting on the sidelines with feelings and reactions and no, nowhere to put it. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's super dangerous. Um, the other thing is that, you know, right now, one of the focuses of what I'm teaching, and this is just a small, small snippet of the curriculum, but it's a very important one, is about helping women deal with the moment they freeze. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this relates to men. I'll get to that in a second. There, there are moments where women choose to stay silent because they have, you know, uh, systemic issues that they might lose a job, money, um, uh, legal things. They might choose to stay silent. There are also these moments of choiceless silence where a woman totally shuts down and freezes and it becomes incredibly difficult for her to speak even if she wants to. Mm -hmm. It's like her nervous system is hijacked. So, um, one of the reasons I'm focusing on teaching women how to break the freeze right now is because I feel like a lot of the, um, the things that especially really well-intentioned men might be experiencing is suddenly being at fault for things in the past 
they had no idea were happening. You know, we say things like men should know better, men should know better, men should know better. That statement is useless because they don't. Right. And they're not getting, and a lot of times they're not getting the feedback they need. We're social beings. We learn in a particular kind of way. We get feedback. They're not getting the feedback that they need. Now, I'm not blaming women and I'm not blaming men. I'm saying this is just something, one of the things that happens that's contributing to the difficulty in having a real conversation about what would it take to have that party at the end of the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are a lot of different ways to, not just a lot of different ways to address this. We need all kinds of tools. We need all kinds of ideas. The, the one that I'm focusing on right now is supporting women when they freeze to be able to speak so that the men that they're in front of, the men that they're dealing with, can have feedback, can have feedback, whether it's, um, and, the, and the chance to clarify their communications, because sometimes just really awkward, uh, clumsy communications from men that are innocent are enough to trigger a woman to a place where she feels violated, mm -hmm. victimized, and cannot speak for herself. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I mean, that fits in with my lineage that uh, men are dumb and women are angry. And <laughs> what's happening <laughs> is that there's a, there's just a lack of communication. I totally agree with you. It's, it's sort of like, I mean, I, I, an associate of mine, a peer of mine, a big name in the sex and relationship community, a teacher basically was brought to the mat with something he did in 2010. And it was an experience where he basically harassed a woman into a sexual activity. I don't want to mention his name uh, just because I don't know the full details of it. And then an interviewer caught up with him, you know, recently and said, what did this happen? You know, what happened? He was really flippant about it. He was very uh, crass about his memory of it eight years ago or seven and a half years ago. He had no idea. And that's because in the moment he had no idea that there was something wrong. And it really struck me about this chasm between something that hits person A so negatively and person B has no idea that anything even happened and it happens all the time between men and women because men and women I think see the world very differently with different levels of sensitivity and the ability to communicate when this happened person A when you did this this is why I felt is so uber important for the improved relations between all people yeah and then there are, there are people who do know better, right? There, sure. there are abuses of power. Of course. And, and the, the thing that, uh, that uh, keeps coming back is, um, especially for a woman, how can she clarify? How can she cut through the, the ambiguity? Mm -hmm. Find out if she knows or not. Is this, is this malicious or is this well-intentioned and super clumsy? Like, mm -hmm. the, the women speaking up is, <laughs> and all that goes into that. Mm -hmm. Super, super important. It's what we're all talking about these days. True. So let's go into this, your practice, your, you know, the thing people are writing about is the art of verbal self-defense. Maybe first you could just define that, explain what it is, and then we can go to some really cool examples I found in this literature written about you. So would you first define what verbal self-defense is? Uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, something we've already been talking about, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, um, it can be great to lead, be on top. It can be great to follow, be on bottom and receive, learn, right? Teacher, student, we see these dynamics everywhere. What happens when you're put on the spot and you don't like what you're getting? Mm. What happens when you, you're put on the spot and you don't like what you're getting and you freeze? Mm -hmm. So um, verbal self-defense, the focus of that part of the curriculum is specifically giving a woman tools for when her system shuts down, she has a thousand thoughts racing in her head, but can't get them out. All her attention is inward. How do you give her access to language back? Hmm. How do you give her her voice back? How do you get her attention out to see the other and be able to speak? So that's um, the verbal self-defense, uh, the online course, 
the uh, live events, they're all about training the, training the body over and over and over again to recognize the moment she's frozen and use a few simple tools in order to get unfrozen and actually be in that conversation with agency and even better, play. Mm-hmm. Powerful playfulness. I love this, uh, this example in the New York Magazine, so I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, <clears throat> so she's talking about a guy going to a dominatrix. Dominatrix have very uh, strict guidelines about what happens in a session. And so if a dude walked in and said, hey, this is nice and all, but when are we going to fuck? A line, Urbaniak, and certainly many a young Hollywood actress has heard, Kasha students are taught to respond with a playful domination. Is that what turns you on, making demands? And I read that, I laughed out loud. You know, I'm not a big laugher out louder uh, in general, but I really like that. I mean, it really, it really just struck home of the disruption and the change. And so I, I thought that was an amazing example of how you can use words to disrupt a man's forward, concentrated, narrow-minded focus. I wanna fuck, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, let's play. <laughs> Yeah, that, that tool is called turning the spotlight. And the essence of it is actually asking a question about the question. Because it's the quickest way to flip the power dynamic. You're on the spot, you're on the bottom, he's on the top. You feel the pressure to answer. It even applies to receiving uncomfortable questions like, why don't you have kids yet? Aren't you too young to have this kind of job? Mm-hmm. Uh, and a, 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 a simple way to flip the power dynamic and turn the spotlight is to ask a question about the question. Do you like making women uncomfortable? Isn't that a personal question for you to be asking right now? Uh, the, the, the dungeon question came for me to, uh, training dominatrixes. So not only was turning the spotlight a way to handle the situation, it was a segue into a whole session. Mm. It was a segue into a whole stream of speech. Oh, you like breaking the rules, do you? You like provoking women. You act like you're here to be a submissive, but really you want to provoke me. Are you asking for punishment so early on in the session? Is that how you like to play? You think that you can provoke me and get me to give you punishment right away before I deemed it ready, before I deemed it time? Hmm. Or are you just so clueless that you need to come to a woman wearing leather to tell her exactly how to be, exactly what to do, how to behave? Is that so? Are you looking for a governess or a police officer? It would, it would end up being the thing that could run the whole hour. Hmm. The fact that he came in and said, so this is nice and all, but when are we going to fuck? I, I like it. I mean, I, I'm thinking personally, not that I've ever been in a dominatrix-like situation. There's time, granted, there's time. And the verbal play, I mean, the verbal play of it is such a turn on. It's like, it's like oh, I'm with a woman who we can joust and debate. I'm sure certain men, there's a a segment of men who would just be like, huh? And then get angry to be challenged. And at the same time, I think the play of it is actually really the exciting part. Probably even more sometimes exciting than the sex. There's a second tool for when they get riled up called location where you just fill in the blank of this sentence. It seems like blank. Is that true? It seems like this has gotten you angry. Is that true? Hmm. I mean, it's the, it's the same thing. And this, this uh, flipping of the dynamic can even work in something as simple as a cat call. So a man yells, nice tits. Even saying something innocuous back, like, where did you get those shoes? Has a woman break out of the freeze and ha- experience herself having agency? Mm-hmm. She doesn't have to come up with something as clever as, do you talk like that to your mama? You know? <laughs> And that would just confuse the guy. <laughs> so let, well, let's just stay on that for a second. Cat calling is a, is a strong interest of mine. And could I, I just don't understand. I don't, under, I don't understand cat calling. It just seems like the most efficient, inefficient communication <laughs> style ever. Hey, baby, hey, baby, as she's walking past and expect to get some nookie out of that. It doesn't make any sense to me. So, but let me ask you a question. Why, why do you think men cat call? Why do you think... Um, they employ this technique to get women's attention. So I can I can only make some guesses based on my own experiences with okay, cat calls. Okay, fair enough. And I, I find that they they are a whole range. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes a guy is with a bunch of guys and he cat calls me, and I almost have a feeling that that cat call wasn't actually for me; it was for his boys. Mm-hmm. 
right? There's that one. Uh, there are the um, ones where I actually feel like a lot of um, appreciation, admiration, mm. and love for women. Uh, I think there's a lot of men who love women and don't have any way to really express it. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that a lot of women find uh, show me a smile really offensive. Mm -hmm. um, I personally love to flash a smile when I'm asked to. Mm. And if somebody tells me I'm beautiful on the street, I thank them. Mm. But it's easy for me to thank them because I know that if they come back at me or start following me, and start um, saying things that make me uncomfortable, I'll know what to do. Mm -hmm. So I like, I and my students can afford to be loving, can afford compassion, can afford play, because we feel safe. Mm -hmm. At least in those areas where our physical safety is not a question at all. But socially safe, socially safe to play back. It becomes really interesting. You can actually uh, have some really interesting conversations that initially began with a pretty retarded, stupid ass cat call. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really love that sense of it because I know there's a lot of written about the Vigilance Center and safety for women is important and without safety, there's no play. And what I just heard in your last statement is that you feel inside of you and you teach your students to feel safe in most situations. Because I know a lot of women walk around angry, frustrated, scared, which doesn't allow them to play because yeah, of basic safety tenets. Is experience. Safety is not built through rules and laws. Safety is built through experience. A person's internal safety, what we do in the classes is we train women. So they actually have things come at them that are really uncomfortable. We get in men to be man interrupters, mansplainers. We get men to come in and invade a woman's physical space. Mm. And she gets to experience herself with guidance, playing back, playing back, until she feels that in the moment, if this were to happen to her in her own life, she would know exactly what to do. And some of them get so excited about these tools that they hope it happens. Mm -hmm. They hope they get resistance. They hope they get some bad behavior because then they'll get to play. And it's just, it's just night and day. And I, I just, I, oh, I could go on about this forever. Mm -hmm. There's so much joy and pleasure and fun to be had in having power, in having a voice, in, in uh, mainly knowing what to do when you freeze so that you can be yourself again. Mm -hmm. Then you what? don't need the whole world to cushion uh, the landscape with safety and... Um, you know, we can't wait for the whole world to change for women to be able to speak their truth. We can't wait for all of the systems and policies and rules and laws to be put in the place to make a woman feel safe. I'm not waiting that long. I, I don't want to wait until the world changes for um, women to feel like it's okay for them to be themselves and speak where they are and even better, be sassy. Mm-hmm. So a few more questions, and then we will uh, probably wrap this up. But I, I want to ask you, I, you know, in the article show really about your history and how it started and your relationship with Ruben. I want to acknowledge Ruben Flores, your creative partner, um, um, an amazing man who's been your cohort along with it. Um, I, but I want to ask you a question. It's like every business has its why. You know, like the why, the generation, the core reason you, you work uphill, you, you do the interviews, you get your ass out of bed and do the filming, you, 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 know, you, you keep going, you deal with the complaints and the, and the possible haters. And so what's your, what's your why? why? Why do you think you're driven for the academy and, and what keeps motivating you to continue when times get hard? The, um, thank you for mentioning Ruben Flores. Mm-hmm. His why matters here too, but his why can't be exactly the same as mine because my why literally comes from my body. Mm -hmm. um, even from the time I was a little girl, I had this very, very real feeling of wanting to speak, not being heard, not being able to express myself. And First, it was entirely personal. 
I wanted to express myself. I wanted to break free. I wanted to bust out. I wanted to uh, be radically, boldly self-expressed. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't easy for me. Um, first, it was something as really simple as uh, I, I didn't speak English very well when I was six. I was born here, but I didn't live here until I was six. Mm -hmm. So first, it was just a language barrier. Then it was being in Catholic school. Then it was being a girl with boys and seeing all these differences. Then it was watching my mother. It was, as I grew up watching my friends, watching all the places where I knew how fucking great they were and the places where that would suddenly go, be gone. They would vanish from a conversation. They would shut down, turn in on themselves. And um, the why for me is so in bodily, bodily ingrained that I can't not do this. Mm. I can't not do this. If I'm not teaching uh, professionally, I'm talking to people and telling them the same thing. And if I'm not talking to people and telling them the same thing, I'm by myself exploring what it means to know what the truth is for me, speaking it and getting out there. The, uh, the world would look very, very different. If people knew how to feel totally legitimate in the truth that they feel mm -hmm. and we're speaking it regularly. Mm. A lot of the problems we see on the planet would be solved. Mm -hmm. And so it comes from the most microcosmic, my personal voice to the biggest planetary issue. That's my why. It's, it's, it's my, why is me? I'm here for this. There's, mm -hmm. there's nothing else I can do. I, I, I don't know. have a I get it. I really get it. I, I, I get it. You know, I, I tried to be a normal person when I left One Taste. I really did. I tried to, to be a civilian, but then, you know, a day or two out of it getting bored and I'm like, all right, I've still got something to say and the importance of that. So the, the last two questions are going to be similar. Um, if you could make a communication to men in this uh, trying, challenging, evolutionary time, what would be your communication to men? What would you like to tell them? I would like to give them an instruction, an order, a command immediately. All right, hit it. <laughs> Ask questions. Ask the women in your life questions about their experiences. Ask the men in your life questions about their experiences ask questions. Right now is a time where a lot of the problems we have are still unnamed and largely invisible. Let's get our attention and awareness on those places to make the invisible visible. Let's reveal how this structure actually works so we can take it the fuck down for the benefit of men, for the benefit of women, and for the benefit of anybody with a beating heart and a brain in their heads. Ask questions. Not listen, not speak, ask questions. Hmm. We need to all go on a massive investigative mi mission that's personal to discover what's actually happening hmm. and to find our part in it. And then if you wanted to make a communication to women, one specific communication, would it be the same? Would it be different? What would you, what would you broadcast to women of the world today? Test your assumptions. Mm. I just know that this, this, this uh, text message meant this. I just know that my father has it in for me. I just know that if I ask, I'll get a no. Just test your assumptions. Have them, test them. The world is a lot friendlier than people realize. There's a lot more love available out there than people realize. And oftentimes it just takes a tiny point of contact for that love to be released and feed both parties, all parties present. Beautiful. I love it. Perfect. All right. So the future is bright for you. How do people work with you? What's available? How do people find out more about you and the work you and Ruben are doing? Uh, a good starting point is to go to the website that's being updated constantly with resources and um, some free materials that anybody can use. 
Um, the website is my name, kashaurbanyak.com. Uh, that's K-A-S-I-A-U-R-B-A-N-I-A-K.com. Um, feel free to email us also with questions. We love to communicate with people, even people who aren't our students, um, and continue taking the temperature and discovering what's happening out there. Great. And you have an upcoming lecture. Is it February 9th, Cornering Harvey? That's right. The second iteration? Cornering Version two, verbal self-defense training camp. So if you guys are in New York and you want to spend an evening on February 9th training with us and uh, uh, applying some of these techniques and tools, join us. That information is also on the website. Great. Well, thank you so much. It's an absolute honor to have you on the show. It's an honor to work with you guys on doing such important work. And I just thank you for your why. And I thank you for your, your message and what you're doing, the impact you're causing. Thank you so much, Rob. My pleasure. All right, folks, that is the end of this week. Fastest 36 minutes of my life here uh, every week, every Thursday, 10 a.m. PST. For more shows, please visit toughlove.live. Also available on iTunes, Stitcher, and all your favorite podcasts apps on your phone. Uh, it's an exciting time, an expansion, 2018 for all of us. Uh, and I really like what, you know, Kasha said, the two things uh, for men, I think it really applies for both all genders and all people. It's one is to ask questions, which is akin to test your assumptions. Uh, we do make a lot of assumptions out of self-protection and your ability to break through this can change your entire life. You know, in my personal life, I have the good fortune of having a partner, uh, my wife Morgan, where we constantly chat about every single thought in our head. And from that, there's so much expansion and possibilities. So I do recommend it as a practice. We'll be back next week uh, with a solo show by me. We're also launching our second set of Tough Loves on Friday called Six Vulnerable Conversations. It'll be available on iTunes. And this show is live every Thursday, 10 a.m. PST. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, thank you, Kasha and Ruben, for the work you do. Thank you to my friend, Michelle, for announcing it on the Sister Goddess Network. I appreciate that. And thank you all of you for living and growing and expanding. Uh, it's a special world out there. Let's make it as optimal as possible. So that's it. Go forth. Get some nookie. Enjoy. I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.